nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay, so let's get started. Today it will be lecture 10 of 606. And today I'm going to talk about potential electric field and charges, EK diagram, a set of, set of uh, information that we will need often uh, over the next few classes or throughout the rest of the semester. So the first thing is, as I mentioned, potential field and charge how they are related to each other, how to calculate them, and so on and so forth. EK diagram is the solution of the Schrodinger equation, right? That is that for every value of K between pi over A to minus pi over A, the Brillouin zone, we have come to learn or understand that there are a set of states in which electrons can sit. That's the EK diagram for a bulk material. If I take this table, there is an EK diagram for the table, right? There is everything that you have in principle, all electronic materials, there will be an EK diagram for it. But band diagram and EK diagram is not the same thing. Band diagram is a position resolved information within the bulk. So one end of the table will might have a different band diagram compared to the other end of the table. Then we'll talk about the basic concepts of donors and acceptors, why we need them, and finally conclude. Consider that I have a semiconductor, and what you see on the top side, on the top picture, the potential moving up and down in this rectangular type potential going up and down. And this reflects, if you remember, these are Coulomb potentials associated with the nucleus of the atoms. And so an electron shown here in red that moves through this crystal field of potential repeatedly being pulled in and out. Now when we discussed all this, we did not discuss about its potential energy. We just assumed that it is sitting grounded with zero potential and we wanted to look at its energy with respect to that potential. But in principle, of course, you can take that same semiconductor and put an external electric field or external potential and pull the entire energy up and down. This is just like having a person being in the first floor and then you take an elevator and put the person in the 10th floor. Now everything about the person has remained the same except by this external potential that you have moved its overall energy so there is a distinction between external potential shown here in a battery so that you are pulling the whole thing up versus an internal potential which is coming from the Coulomb interaction from them. Now from this you remember that what we have done that we have gotten read of the internal crystal potential by this EK diagram because the EK diagram essentially contains the information about how we, how the spacing of the atoms, the potential depth of the atoms, the EK diagram knows about them all, right? So now if you want to look at this in the EK diagram, consider an electron sitting at a certain K away from the center. So naturally it will have, with respect to the bottom of that uh, uh, band, it has a certain amount of kinetic energy h square k, h bar square k square divided by 2 m naught, right? That's the amount of kinetic energy it has. But in addition, of course, it has the potential energy, this point EC. Now, this potential energy could be zero, right? This I could have a reference. Or if I put an external battery, put the whole thing in a cage which has a higher potential, then I can move the EC, the bottom of the band, arbitrarily up and down. And my total energy is therefore will be EC minus E reference. And notice this sign because we are always talking about electrons, where the electrons sit, electrons energy and so on and so forth. So we have a minus Q. 
multiplied by the potential V. Now the E reference, what is the value of E reference? It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, whatever value you choose, whatever value you choose, we'll always be talking about the difference, potential difference. And therefore, whatever value you choose for E reference, eventually these will all disappear as a difference. So we shouldn't worry about that too much. Okay, so these two things, potential energy and kinetic energy, together it makes, of course, the total energy of the electron. Now, one thing uh, I want to mention here, that assume that a semiconductor is one centimeter. I have a EK diagram. If it were two centimeter cube or five centimeter cube, you see, when I look at the EK diagram, I essentially have the same EK diagram, right? Because eventually I will do it per unit volume, per unit length. So I will actually take care of that. However, <coughs> one question you could ask that at what point, how big does a solid have to be? I mean, no solid is infinite. How big does a solid have to be before it develops the EK diagram? Right? That means that you have the periodic condition, all the energy levels are essentially equal, uh, the space in bands. How long does it have to be? It turns out on the order of maybe 5 to 10 atoms is, is enough. 5 to 10 atoms, as far as you are th th thinking about EK diagram, is actually more than enough. Otherwise, and I will explain that later in the course, if 5 to 10 were not enough, then the computer you are using would be unusable because the computer you use has a very thin layer called gate oxide, which prevents carrier tunneling. Remember, carrier tunneling through the gate. That is these days is one nanometer, half the size of a DNA. That is how things are single strand, equal to the size of a single stranded DNA. And even that can prevent the leakage current essentially through it. So that means that within that 10, uh, 1 nanometer, which is about 6 atoms or so, it has developed the full band, band gap. That's why it's preventing currents from going. You will understand the statement a little bit later, but the, I, what I'm saying that essentially on the 10 to 15 will be more than enough to de develop the EK diagram. So let me then break the solid, break the solid up into the units of maybe 20 atoms, let's say. I break it up and at if each of the sections, each of these 10 atom units are all at the same potential, then I can say that I have the EK diagram for each section. For each 20 atoms, I have EK diagram and they are all in the same potential. So I have drawn them all linearly on the same horizontal line, right? Potential is away from the, how far is it up over the reference energy? So therefore, they are all at the same energy because they are all in the same potential. Now, if you take that same semiconductor, one dimensional semiconductor, but in a set, now you do the following that round the left hand side, left hand corner, which is V equals zero, and then apply a voltage on the right hand corner, which is V equals V1. Then of course you realize that if it is one side is zero volt, another side is five volt, then in between the potential will gradually change. You know, 0.2 volts, 0.4 volts, it will gradually change to five volts. And here I have just divided into five sections for simplicity of drawing. So if it is five volts, you can say that the green one, that region is approximately at one volt, the slight blue one, light blue one, two volts, and so on and so forth. Now what would be the corresponding EK diagram for such a system. Do you see that this should be the corresponding EK diagram? Why? Because each section is sitting at a slightly different potential. If I assume that on the left hand side, that green EK diagram is sitting at potential zero, then everywhere, every other EK diagram will gradually shift down. Now, it's not an exact diagram, of course, but this is the idea that gradually the, it will gradually go down. Why does it go down? Because I have applied a plus V, and remember the energy is minus QV. So when something is at plus 5 volts, 
that means electron energy has gone down by minus qv. So, that is why I have drawn the right hand side lower than the left hand side. Okay. So, that is what the energy or potential energy is. Now, you see the potential energy is changing as a function of position. Now, the E k diagram will of course, if you have a big solid, there will be lots of points like this. So, that is not a problem. Now, let us talk about potential fields and charges. Let us say somebody has given you this stop diagram where the potential, then this is the energy means minus q v. So, therefore, if you just wanted to calculate the potential v, then this is how it must have gone down. Why is it? Think about it for a second. The left hand corner on the very top E k diagram, I am setting that to be 0. And the energy on the right hand side of the E k diagram, you know, right hand, the last figure, blue and red, the last one is at minus q v. That is how much the energy have gone down. If you just wanted to know v, not minus q v, then you will divide the top diagram with minus q. And if you do that, you will see the whole thing will flip upward. So, that is the potential. You can see the there is a change between let us say 1 to 2, from 2 to 3 is approximately the same. It is just a diagram. And from 3 to 4, there is a jump up in the potential because I am just dividing it up on the other side. If this is my potential, what is the electric field? Do you agree that this has to be my electric field? Why? Because electric field is a derivative of the potential with a minus sign. Think about the green curve for a second. From 0 to the first point where it changes its slope, if I take a derivative, the derivative is 0, right? So, the electric field from that point to the first box in the magenta 1, that is 0. Now, you can see that from first point to the second point, there is a change in the slope. Take a derivative change in the slope is the magenta line. But this time, do you see that it has gone below 0? Why below 0? Because the electric field has a minus sign, minus dv dx. And then you can easily understand how the rest of the thing proceeds. Now, what is charge? Charge is one step more that take the derivative of the electric field with respect to position and that gives you the charge. So, you do the same. For example, in the magenta curve, take this derivative of the line, it was 0 to begin with independent of position, it stays there for derivative is 0, right? Now, you can see the magenta curve makes a rapid change uh, at that point. At, at, at the first point, first transition point, and so there will be a delta function in the derivative. Then from, let us say, point, uh, from this point to this point, then there is constant field, derivative is 0, you get the idea. That is how you calculate it. Now, in reality, what will happen? People will give you the blue diagram on the bottom, and we will see that. And what you will have to do is go up in the direction. So, they will give you the blue charge distribution, then you will calculate the electric field, then you will calculate the potential. Now, it is a very good idea to learn to do it graphically. You can always do a complicated integral with, you know, boundary condition here and there and all sorts of things. But you see, all you have to do from going from one diagram to another is to integrate the area under the curve for the previous one up to a given point x, right? If you do that, you will get constructed easily, learn to do it because that is how we will make your life significantly simpler, okay? So, this is the E k, this is the charge potential and electric field, how you calculate each other, uh, calculate them. Now, let me talk about this E k diagram versus band diagram, how they are different. It is a conceptual difference, it is not really a convenient and I, let me show you. Uh, you remember from last class about carrier distribution that we have a density of state for each band of course and then we have multiplied the, by the probability that a state is occupied and then we get 
the certain number of electrons and similarly we get if we multiply with 1 minus f then you get a certain number of holes right this we have seen and this we have we can easily calculate so the, the other day for intrinsic semiconductor do you remember the value we calculated do you remember this was ni with the geometric mean of nc and nv the effective density of state and e to the power the gap divided by 2 divided by kt right that's what we have half the value so that value that is how much we calculate now it's very important that you understand how small ni is and i'm going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes ni if you put it put some numerical values in one ev band gap uh, put this the number will come out for silicon on the order of 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube right 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube how many atoms do we have per centimeter cube approximately 10 power 22 or so so we have 10 power 22 atoms 10 power 10 number of uh, electrons so that means I have one electron every trillion, 10 to the power 12, every trillion atoms. So you can see why when we did Fermi-Dirac, we didn't have to think about Coulomb interaction because one electron, there's a trillion of neighbors before it sees another electron from the other one, right? Far, far apart, about 10,000 atoms in each side, like 5,000 angstrom before it sees another electron. So it's a very, very dilute uh, uh, electron number and that's why intrinsic semiconductors are not very good conductor to begin with. With that few electrons, what are you going to do? Now, that information uh, will also be useful a little bit later, but let me now point out to this point that I also made this argument that most of the electrons sit within a few kT of the bottom of the band, right? So instead of really thinking about how they are spread out and everything, why not I take those states, the red one over there, which is density of state multiplied by few kT. That gives me the effective density of state and squish them all down to the bottom of the band. And that is what the NC and NV is. These are delta functions which I have integrated over a few kT multiplied by the density of state. Try this out. The density of state, take that expression, multiply with kT. Don't do anything else. You will see you are almost getting the expression for the effective density of state because that's what the area under that red curve is or the blue curve is. All right. So I have this effective density of state NC and NV with one line. I represent all the energy resolved information, right? Now, I have that picture, you remember, but I don't want to keep drawing all sorts of EK diagram. I mean, that will take forever. But should I then do this? I can, in fact, for the, all the EK diagram, remember only the bottom little bit of KT is being occupied. For the valence band, only a little bit is being occupied. So I'm going to replace all those things with NC and NV at energy EC and AV throughout this region. So I'm going to, in fact, not even do that. I'm just going to draw a continuous line. But remember, each point on that line hides in it. You're supposed to see in your mind that there's an EK diagram hanging on each point of this continuous curve because that point actually involves the information about all the quantum mechanics, defective density of state, all those things are actually hiding in this line. Why two? Because I'm just most of the time it's a conduction and valence band. That are the two bands that I'm interested in. Don't think that it is just two. Of course, there are lots of bands. And if I needed, info, sometimes there may be four bands carrying current. Then instead of two lines, I'll have four lines following through this because it's the EK diagram, just encapsulated in a slightly different form. Okay. So from here, anytime you have the top picture with the EK going like that, you will exactly do the same thing. And you can see in there, therefore, Y potential is just the flip of the conduction band energy or the valence band energy. 
and that's how the band diagram that top picture will be called a band diagram and the band diagram is related to potential with just minus q that's it and then you can do all the calculations as before now up to this point uh, i have told you all this these are just preparatory information we'll use it over and over again you will see uh, but for the time being uh, let me start by talking about another additional piece of information now i just made this argument a few slides back that the intrinsic concentration of electrons in a semiconductor is very small 10 to the power 10 for silicon for 10 to the power 22 atoms one in a trillion for gallium arsenide it is 10 to the power 6 part 10 to the power 22 one in every 10 to the power 16 atoms you have one electron sitting and in a silicon dioxide like the window glass not even one electron if you made the whole earth made of silicon dioxide 10 to the power 27 is per centimeter cube is a volume of the earth if you made the whole thing about with you will not find one electron in the conduction band because the band gap is 9 ev so you can see there's no hope of finding anything you find it for a different reason but so the point is normal semiconductors most of the time will carry zero current no electrons so what is going to carry so therefore you have to dope it with additional things these are called donors and acceptors now in thinking about donors and acceptors people will be drawing a picture that is a little bit different from what you have learned from the crystal so for example this is a gallium arsenide face centered cubic do you remember face centered cubic lattice one fourth along the diagonal you have the other atom the uh, sitting there you know all those now if you take any one of the corners and you realize that this is a tetragonal side it has it's connected to four neighbors right it's connected to four neighbors and actually you should convince yourself every atom here is connected to four neighbors now drawing three-dimensional diagram is always a challenge so therefore what people do instead of drawing this in a four di dimensional diagram they press it in on a two-dimensional picture like this so for example you take the gallium uh, gallium one which is the center magenta one you will see that it is being connected to the four neighboring blue uh, arsenic ones right and every one is actually connected to four different neighbors so actually what they are doing because we want to simplify the pictures that we draw the top picture is a simplified equivalent of the bottom picture and here these are covalent bonds because electrons are being shared one from arsenic one one from gallium or for silicon for example and therefore you will see a pair of lines connecting the atoms the blue and the magenta atoms with a pair of lines that's sharing of the electrons for example for silicon this is a perfect sharing it's a pure covalent bond so that is a picture we'll be drawing but remember actually when we are drawing that picture we are actually drawing the three-dimensional crystal that's what we are actually doing now think about what happens when i have silicon so i have my silicon picture again you know the, it's not gallium arsenide so i don't draw two types of magenta and blue these are all silicon so i just draw blue here i realize that a number of intrinsic concentration minuscule so i have to do something about it what can i do i can put a throw in a bunch of phosphorus atoms in here now first thing to notice that if i put in a phosphorus atom and this is a very important statement every atom every one of them carries a certain number of protons certain number of electrons and generally they are the same proton has also the same number of electrons and same number of protons it has one extra electron but it also has one extra proton so when i sprinkle a bunch of phosphorus atoms in the whole thing is still charge neutral do you see because i have brought in an extra electron but i also brought in an extra proton so the whole thing is still charge neutral 
charge is still conserved. However, the one electron extra electron in proton, uh, the phosphorus, that may be available for conduction. For example, I have shown in the bottom that extra electron in phosphorus. Phosphorus is other electrons that I haven't shown. But the extra electron I have shown here in the, in the blue uh, red point. And of course, there is a corresponding extra proton sitting there also in the background of the silicon network. You see this? Okay. Now, it's a very important statement because people often get tripped on this, this idea. They think that phosphorus is an extra electron. Therefore, I always have an extra charge. Not true. Because it also brought in a, an extra proton along with it. Now, this electron, how do I know where would the electron sit? Because it's not silicon anymore. There's a few extra phosphorescent. Where will the electron sit? I can think about it this way. I can think about it a phosphorus doped silicon as being pure phosphorus, pure phosphorus plus, I'm uh, sorry, pure silicon plus one extra proton sitting in the center and one extra electron going around it. Is that right? Because phosphorus has just one extra, so I, anything extra, I put it in the right hand side like a hydrogen like diagram and everything that is almost like silicon, I put it on the left hand side with a bunch of blue things. Now let me assume at this point and I'll prove that assumption in a second that this extra electron can be viewed that it is swimming in the background of silicon atoms. So there are lots of silicon atoms. So I take the left hand side and make it a gel because it's so big, so many atoms there that essentially they can all be viewed as a background material. And I'm thinking about this extra electron going around the extra proton over there for phosphorus, right? Okay, so I can calculate this energy level, can I? How do I do that? Because I already know from hydrogen levels where the level has to be. This formula you have seen before. In fact, you have seen maybe in lecture two, I pointed out when we said hydrogen levels uh, and you remember 13.6 divided by one over n squared. I'm thinking about the first level. So my n is one. So you don't see that one divided by n squared here. But apart from that, if you open your book, it's exactly the same formula, q to the power 4, m star and everything. Why is it m star? Because in the hydrogen case, the hydrogen atom was moving in a vacuum. So it was a free electron there. And so therefore, I put a m naught there. But this time, however, this extra electron moving in a sea of silicon atoms, right? And therefore, it is feeling the potential of the silicon atoms. It's being bounced by those potentials. Therefore, the effective mass has to be uh, M host, whatever the host material is. On the other hand, also on the bottom side, you see I have the dielectric constant of silicon. Why? Because when a proton is attracting the electron, this potential is being mediated by this, the dielectric constant of the material, host material, right? So therefore, I have that, that number. Okay, there's no rocket science here, very simple. Now, if you uh, want to express it in terms of hydrogen things, hydrogen expressions that we already know, so I have taken everything, I have multiplied with M0 and divide by M0, the red M0 and the black M0. So it multiplied and divide. And similarly, you can see that I have taken the kappa for the host to the right hand side, the K for the host on the right hand side. So the left hand side, the red, red thing in red, I already know. Do you remember that it was 13.6 in the hydrogen atom case? That was 13.6 and that's why I pointed it out. Let's quickly calculate this number. What is the typical effective mass for a, uh, for an electron? Let's say one tenth of the free mass. So that will be 0.1. And what is the typical dielectric constant of a material, silicon and others? On the order of 10 also, right? On the order of, yeah. So, so you have 1 over 10 squared and M host multiplied by M naught is 0.1, let's say. 
So I have to divide 13.6 by a 1000. How much is that? So it will be 13 milli electron volts. You see, very, very small. And therefore, when you look at the level where the, this atom sits, it's a bound level. So it's a little bit lower. And this is about, let's say, 13 milli electron volts. So very close. What is the band gap? Band gap is about a EV. And that is electron sits about 13 milli electron volts from the band. And that's how this electron is so easy to detach. Had it been a pure hydrogen, he would need 13 volts to make the electrons go. Here, 13 milli electron volts. Room temperature, KT is 25 milli electron volts. Right? So even in room temperature, most of them will escape from the bound level, you see. Now I made another approximation and let me, the another approximation is that the electron moves so far out that it encaps, encapsulates or encompasses a lot of silicon atoms, right? That's what I said. That's how I made the blue almost like a continuum, right? Is that true? Well, again, I can calculate. This is again from that hydrogen atom picture. You can see the effective mass and the dielectric constant has been replaced. Calculate the whole thing and you can convince yourself that for this material approximately the radius of the electron moving around is about 13 angstrom on the order of 13 to 15 angstrom. How far away does the hydrogen atom electron, uh, hydrogen electron go? you know, about a 0.5 to 1 angstrom. So that's how close it is because the charge is very really strongly being pulled. Now this is moving around about 13 angstrom around and the effective, uh, the A for the lattice is on the order of A divided by 2, the, this uh, spacing, which is a few angstrom. That means it encapsulates hundreds of atoms in its circuit, you see. Inside it, it's moving around in a big, big orbit and lots of silicon atoms are sitting there. Now you should see table 1.6 and 4.1 and put some, begin to put some numbers in to convince yourself that the argument is true. This is not always true. And I can always give you an exam problem why this is not true and why, just to see whether you know the difference between real effective mass when you should use it and when you shouldn't. But just like hydrogen atom, you can have one level. There are some other donor levels where you can have two levels below the gap. There are some other levels shown here on the right on the yellow where you can have three levels, uh, a level deep in the, in the gap. Now there is a convention that anytime you have a donor which is in the upper half of the gap, red and the blue ones, the word donor will not be written. And in this case, you will always assume that this has an extra electron. It, is, it gives the electron out to the conduction band. It only talks to the conduction band. For anything that is below, people always assume that it should talk to the valence band. But if you want to suggest otherwise, that it only donates electron, in that case, you should write a small d to indicate that it is actually a donor, although it is sitting way down in the energy gap. It's just a convention, it's no physics here. You can do the same thing for boron, and which is an acceptor atom. Again, remember this is charge neutral, it has one less electron, one less proton, charge neutral. And again, you can think about the same calculation one extra electron and you can think about that as there's a hole which is moving around like this. So the extra electron will be like the core of this and the hole will go around it. Same calculation, I will not go through it. And again, the same ideas that do you see that anytime I am talking about a donor or sorry, acceptor, generally it talks to the valence band. And anytime I want to suggest that a level which is up but still is actually an acceptor, I'll put a symbol A on the next to it, just to indicate that there's a donor level, or I'm sorry, an acceptor level. And finally this, 
sometimes there are donors and acceptors which are uh, sometimes there are atoms which in a material behaves like a donor sometimes behaves like a donor and sometimes behaves like an acceptor so it has a split personality now depends on environment of course so for example i'm thinking about gallium arsenide I'm thinking about gallium arsenide and let's say i take germanium or silicon and i put sprinkle down silicon in gallium arsenide now from a gallium's perspective from gallium's perspective silicon has an extra electron and an extra proton so it's a donor as far as gallium is concerned now as far as arsenic is concerned well it has one less electron and one less proton so as far as arsenic is concerned this is like a acceptor level right and so depending on which atom the silicon you know silicon you introduce it is either going to kick out a gallium and take its place or kick out an arsenic and take its place right it's going to do either one of the two if it kicks out a gallium the red one if it takes out kicks out a gallium then it has for the overall semiconductor it has one extra electron to give one extra electron uh, one extra proton to give right so that's that will be a donor level on the other hand if it kicks out a arsenic and sits in there that place right then overall it has one ex less electron one less proton so it will be an acceptor type now this moving one to another many times you know you have the leds there are these white leds that is being uh, being replaced in many places in you know, street signs and others one of the problem and many professors spend their lifetime uh, in doing this is making sure that it preferentially goes to one place versus the other there are many materials which you can it only wants to go to let's say gallium one side doesn't want to go to the other side and sometimes it will go equally on both sides and eventually you don't have anything constructive because some gave some extra electron others took it out and at the end you're back to your intrinsic semiconductor what is what is uh, that good? so these type of things a uh, dopants are called amphoteric doping and controlling this i'm sure if so many of you will probably have research projects where controlling this will be a part of your thesis right so it's a very important topic the thermodynamics of it and how this goes but that will be covered in a different course and different time but remember this definition now i want you to read this table uh, because be able to read this table because this is something uh, you will be using in the next homework do you see let's, let's just focus on germanium uh, 0.66 ev on the band gap on the top side you can see the gap center dashed land line going throughout and you can see various dopants atoms lithium and then what is that tin sb is tin and then phosphorus arsenic and so on and so forth now you can see a number written like 0093 Nine, that means this is 0093 ev below that level and at room temperature 25 milli electron volts that level will certainly be all ionized it will give away its electron and therefore it's a good donor and there is phosphorus you see 0.012 we in 5 seconds ago i calculated right what was it i was calculated about 0.013 right 13.6 divided by 1000 that is how that number 0.013 came about and going down you can see 0.14 and 0.28 and in that case it has two levels from which it can donate the 0.14 will be easy to donate 0.28 will be more difficult right and do you see in sum uh, you have indicated by d do you see any one of them not probably on that one but you can see in silicon on the right hand side for tungsten there's a d 0.31 and d that means this is not an acceptor this level actually talks to the conduction band this is a donor very bad donor of course because it is sitting so deep you'll really need a lot of energy to let it go but with light and other things you can let it go 
Now you can see correspondingly all the acceptor levels, the boron we just discussed, 0 0.01 EV just above the valence band and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also see that there are things marked as an A. So for example, copper in germanium on the top side on the right hand side, you can see it is say rate 0.26 but underneath an A. That means that that level, that one level talks to the valence band and it is actually an acceptor, not a donor. So these informations we will need over and over again when you do actual calculation. Okay, so what I had to discuss today was that bulk electron density uh, can, can, cal can be calculated by density of state and Fermi Dirac statistics, right? That we, <laughs> that we discussed. And we also talked about this notion of a band diagram and how to construct it from an EK diagram. Don't forget it. You know, many people actually uh, learn these things but never see the connections explicitly. So anytime you have a new material, people often get tripped. This is something people have done for 50 years for silicon. So all the diagram and everything has been all been set. You can almost memorize them. But many times as uh, in, in new electronics, your material will be very different. Your EK diagrams will be very different. And so unless you know the algorithm by which they were constructed, it is unlikely that you will calculate them correctly or draw them correctly. Okay. Now the intrinsic carrier concentration is very small. Uh, this is something, uh, therefore, most of the semiconductor must be doped in order to make them useful, in order to have a certain number of carriers. Because think about it, if you dope silicon with 10 to the power 16 number of phosphorus, 10 to the power 16, they will all give away their electron. So in the background, you had 10 to the power 10, right? Its own intrinsic concentration for silicon was 10 to the power 10. Just by putting 10 to the power 16 atoms in, you now get 10 to the power 16 number of free carriers available for conduction. 10 to the power 16 is not a large number, you see, because the total number centimeter cube is 10 to the power 22 per centimeter cube, right? So you are putting one phosphorus atom in a million, but still, that the or its own asset is so few, silicons or germanium, so few that even this minuscule contribution from phosphorus still controls the conduction process in this material. So doping is central uh, for semiconductor for good conduction. And I also tried to explain why the dopant atom behaves like a hydrogen atom and with a modified dielectric constant and effective mass, right? And this is something you should check out, put some numbers in, uh, because when I say it, of course, I know these things, I have worked this out, but unless you start putting some numbers in the calculator yourself, this will not sink in in you that how dramatic, how dramatic these energy levels are compared to an hydrogen atom, how large the radius of the orbit is with respect to the hydrogen atom. All right, so I'll end here and next class uh, we'll, we'll continue.